Whew, what a day, man. Uh, been uh, been an uh, uh, insane, insane uh, day. And, uh, uh, you know, it started off late last night after I finished the show uh, late last night with the news that uh, basically Republicans had lost both the Senate seats in uh, Georgia. You could tell that that was the outcome late last night. Since then, it's been called both both seats are going to Democrats. And then today, uh, you know, it started out uh, with the uh, joint session of Congress and uh, Republicans challenging the results, started out with the results from uh, Arizona, and each chamber going into their own location in order to vote uh, on whether to accept the challenge or not to accept the challenge. And the plan was to do that with five or six different states. Of course, uh, that all ended when uh, after when after a uh, pro-Trump rally uh, in the mall, uh, a Trump rally where Trump spoke, where Trump Jr. spoke, where Giuliani spoke, uh, where there was a lot of call it incitement, uh, where there was a lot of basically encouragement to this is this is you know this is the struggle. And you guys better do something about it. Um, after that, and after uh, Pence, uh, Vice President Pence basically said he would not do as uh, Trump asked him, which was to, uh, in a sense, not certify uh, the votes and send them back to the states, something that he correctly deemed, um, you know, correctly deemed, um, he correctly deemed as unconstitutional. Um, and that got the crowd even more upset, got Trump upset. Trump was wailing against him. Anyway, at the end of all of that, uh, parts of the audience that had, uh, that had uh, come to uh, demonstrate support for Trump and to, uh, to participate in this pro-Trump rally on a day where uh, Congress was going to certify Biden uh, as the next president of the United States, uh, you know, the, the, the Capitol building was stormed. And uh, pictures that I never thought I would see uh, in America, you know, we saw. Uh, we saw uh, uh, people storming in uh, to the Capitol, walking in. Uh, we saw uh, uh, members of Congress huddling under their tables, under their desks, being ushered out by security. We saw uh, uh, police and security uh, with guns drawn uh with uh, you know in, in a, a guess uh to try to hold back the crowds and and protect the congressman uh we saw president uh, vice president um the vice president ushered away and uh and uh you know uh, uh, from congress and and taken i guess to an undisclosed location who knows where probably not welcome in the white house with trump then and it, you know, it just scenes of trashing uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, masks, you know, just just absurd, absurd scenes of mayhem and chaos and violence uh, by Trump supporters against the police. Now, I know, I know there are going to be trolls here and they're going to be people online who are going to claim, oh, no, no, those were Trump people. Those were all Antifa. They infiltrated the Trump rally and they did it all. You believe that? I've got some great real estate that I, I, I don't have any, but I know people who have real estate that they'd love to send you, sell you uh, in, um, in, in Florida. Y you know, this is, this is, should have been anticipated. It doesn't really, when you think about it, it's not really surprising. Uh, it, is, uh, it is shocking. Uh, it, you know, it, what it isn't really expected but it's not, it's not surprising when you think about it after the fact. When you think about, if you think about the whole rally and you think about the people that, um, just, just think about all those people wrapped around, not in, not in American flags. There's some American flags waving out there. But people literally wrapped around, waving, but, but embracing, embracing. Um, Donald Trump flags. This is a, about a personality. This is about the worship of a man. This is about 
a movement centered around a man, not around ideas, because Donald Trump has no ideas. He's never had any ideas. He is the ultimate pragmatist. His ideas are he's against those people. He's against certain businessmen. He's against certain industries. He's certainly you know, against anybody associated with the press. He's against and he's against the left, uh, even though he, as part of his economic policies, has embraced much of the policies of the left. But he has a man and a movement that represents no ideas, is not represented by any ideas, but is about the worship of a man. And those people walking around Capitol Hill with flags of Donald, Donald Trump flags wrapped around their body really concretize this in a way that is, you know, shocking, shocking and horrific. And the idea that they're fighting for America, that they're waving an American flag, that this is about America, when they are clearly advocating for policies that go against the American Constitution, they go against the principles of America, that violate the principles that they supposedly stand for. And it, it's not like they have the balls or the guts to actually declare a revolution and to declare, to put out a statement about what they're fighting for and declare that they are revolting against the government that is oppressing them. It's not like they are standing for liberty or justice. No, they're standing up for a man. Not for the law, not for the Constitution, not for America. But for a man, this is exactly the kind of mentality that brings about authoritarianism. This is exactly the kind of mentality that brings us towards a dictatorship. Whether that dictatorship ultimately comes from the left or the right, this mentality is a mentality of authoritarianism. Now, you will say, oh, but the left, okay, so it's also on the left. It's also on the left. That's even scarier that there are no defenders anymore of the actual constitution, of the actual principle of the rule of law, of America. People talk about peace, people talk about peaceful demonstrations, although I think that's almost a contradiction, peaceful demonstration, because if I'm stuck in a traffic jam because of their demonstrations, I'm not sure how peaceful that is to me. But put, a, put aside the whole issue of demonstrations. There is no one standing up today for the cause of America, for the cause of the Constitution, for the cause of the principles of the rule of law, for the cause of capitalism and freedom and limited government. There's just authoritarians of the right, authoritarians of the left. And today, the authoritarians of the right stormed the Capitol building. They stormed the Capitol building. Now, I wouldn't call it insurrection or coup because they're too incompetent and didn't have a plan and then, you know, just were violent thugs, emotionalists without a plan for a revolution. But yeah, they, what they did was commit treason, engage in violence. And what this symbolized, really, what this symbolized, really, oh, good, I've got all, the, all, the, all my haters on, uh, on, the, uh, on the chat. This is going to be fun. And what this symbolized is, is the fact that the right has abandoned the rule of law. The right has abandoned any semblance of adherence to the, the Constitution or to elections or to anything. It is their emotions versus the emotions of the left. That's all there is. There is no more standard of objectivity. There is no standard of the rule of law because they don't trust the courts either. The courts are out. Congress is meaningless. The only thing that matters is Donald Trump. They worship at his feet. That is what we're seeing. They wrap themselves, not in the American flag, but in the flag of Donald Trump. Now, I've been warning about this. I, I hate to say I told you so. No, I don't really, because I have told you so, but I hate the fact that it came true. I've been warning about this from day one. I've been warning about this for five years. Somebody said that calling Donald Trump today a narcissist on Twitter 
was a cheap shot. No, it's not a cheap shot when you've been defending that position for five years. It is Donald Trump's fault that he lost the election on November 3rd. American people were sick and tired of his antics. We're sick and tired of him. Not of Republicans. They were sick and tired of him. And you know they weren't sick and tired of Republicans. The Republicans did well in the Senate. And they did exceptionally well in the House. And indeed, across the entire country, propositions advocated by the far left failed in state after state. American people were sick and tired of Donald Trump, his pragmatism, his emotionalism, his narcissism, his irrationality, his disrespect for the rule of law, his disrespect for the Constitution, his disrespect for anything that disagreed with Donald Trump. He had disrespect for his own people, people who stood by him. But as soon as expressed the slightest disagreement with him, were kicked out on their asses into the street. Time and time again, appointed, appointee after appointee after appointee in the Trump administration, came in with a lot of fanfare. These were the greatest people in the world until they disagreed with Trump, and then they were out. This is all about the American people being sick of this guy and voting him out. Yes, turnout was exceptionally high. You know why turnout was exceptionally high? Because Americans had enough, and they turned out, and the elections were made easy for them through vote, mail-in voting. The turnout was high on the Democratic side, high on the Republican side, high on the Democratic side, because people and independents, because people were tired of it. But then Republicans still had a chance of saving this election, of becoming an opposition party to Joe Biden and the Democrats, of getting a stalemate, of getting divided government, of getting their way. They all they had to do was win one seat in Georgia, one of the reddest states in the country. One seat in Georgia out of two races. Again, Donald Trump's antics, Donald Trump's disrespect of Americans, Donald Trump alienated independents, alienated those suburban voters that are so crucial, alienated Republicans who said, what's the point of voting? It's rigged anyway. And turnout among Republicans was way lower than expected. And guess what? The Democrats want both seats. But even that is not enough. His obsession and narcissism are such that he continued this morning to talking about how this election was illegal and how it was fraudulent. Well, if it's illegal and fraudulent, then it makes sense for people to storm the Capitol. If it's illegal and fraudulent, then yeah, we're fighting for justice and freedom in the American way. And it's direct encouragement for them because what else can they do? The fact is that legally Biden is going to be president on January 20th. I don't care what you say on the chat. And come January 21, I expect you all to come on and admit you were wrong. But Biden is going to be president. So the only way to stop that is, I don't know, a coup, I guess. But they don't have what it takes to have a coup. The military is not going to do anything. So what do they do? Well, what emotionalists do, they become violent because that's what emotionalists do when they don't have any other channel for their emotions, for their views, for their frustrations. Frustrations fueled constantly by Donald Trump. And then when you saw, when things got out of hand in the Capitol, a woman is shot, she's dead by a Capitol police officer. What does Trump do? He puts out a one minute video saying, oh, go home, but you're right. Go home, but this election was stolen from you. You're not being represented up there. So fuel it, fuel the anger, fuel the hatred, fuel the dissent, fuel the frustration, fuel the future violence. And there will be future violence. For those of you who still believe that it was stolen, where's the evidence? 
Evidence. We have a system of evidence in this country, a system of laws, not of men, of laws. And yes, our court system is not perfect. But 60 to zero, 60 to zero. And have you seen, have you read the judge's comments about the lawsuits filed? How scathing they are against Giuliani and all those various lawyers who filed the cases? Have you read the actual things by Trump appointees, by Republican judges? On what basis do you claim that there was fraud? On the basis that you hate Democrats? That is the new objective standard of truth? I hate Democrats, therefore anything they do is wrong, therefore anything they do is fraudulent, therefore I demand we get my way. Talk about subjectivism, talk about emotionalism, talk about lowering yourself to the level of the worst people on the far left. And what we saw today was the far left. The far left is the far right. What's the difference? They're the same. I mean, it is infuriating to watch this. Now, it is true. <laughs> it is true that Antifa is rioting all across America. Absolutely right. Still happening, by the way, in Portland last night. Riots, demonstrations, burning stuff down. Still happening. And the media, many in the media, are not covering it. They don't care. And they should care. And it's a huge story. But that justifies, that justifies storming Capitol Hill, stopping illegal, you know, illegal session of Congress to officially declare that Biden is indeed president elect, which is going to happen tonight. Nothing's going to stop that. Here we got people now uh, actively advocating for violence on my chat, right? Actively advocating for violence on my chat. I will kill globalists, Frank said. <laughs> yes, that's the way to bring about liberty and freedom in America. You know, cowards, all of you, cowards. Cowards. And of course, why? Why was Capitol Police not ready for this? Why? Were they weren't people out there? Was, were the National Guard already deployed? Well, because nobody expected, nobody expected that the Capitol would be stormed. I mean, I was there in 2009 when, I don't know, somewhere between half a million and two million Tea Partiers filled that mall. And they were angry. They were angry at Trump. We were angry. I was there. I was one of the speakers. Obama just being elected. Obamacare was going to be passed. And they were furious. And they were upset. But the spirit of that event was not, we're going to storm Capitol Hill and destroy it the system of government that is the United States. The atmosphere was, we are going to fight. And what are we going to fight with? With our fists? With guns? No, we're going to fight with ideas. We're going to fight for the Constitution. We're going to fight for America. We're going to fight for the principles that this country is based on. That was the Tea Party. And there were maybe a million people out there in the media poo-pooed it and they underestimated how many people were there and they made fun of the people who were there and they were good people who were there, who really believed, who really wanted to believe that they could change America and bring it back to its foundation. And what are those people now? Well, if you look at the crowd today who stormed the Capitol, well, most of them were young, probably not there in 2009, but a number of them were, I'm sure. Because what the right in America has given up on 
what Trump has led the charge to giving up on is ideas. What Trump has led the charge of giving up on is on America, is on the American system of government, is on the intellectual, philosophical, ideological struggle that we have. For Trump and the new right, this is not about ideas. This is about power. And power is to be seized by all means, by any means. I mean, do you have any doubt? Does anybody out there have any doubt at this point that if Trump could, could, he wouldn't mobilize the army to keep him in the White House? Is there any doubt that the only reason he doesn't do that is because he knows that they will disobey his command? Trump's presidency will go down as the most destructive presidency in American history. It has divided this country in ways that no president has ever divided it. It, it has emptied any intellectual content out of the conservative right. It has turned this country into a collection of tribes battling each other. We're going to see more violence, not less in the future, particularly if Trump remains involved in politics. <sighs> this, you know, I won't say this is the beginning of the end, but this is a, 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 an important signpost in the end of what America is and what America represents. Not because these kooks did anything significant. They didn't. It's more symbolic than anything else. It's Trump's behavior that's important. It's Trump's attitude that is significant. And, you know, think about what the rest of the world looks at. They look at America. I mean, we have come a long way. <laughs> a long way. From being the shiny city in the hill that Ronald Reagan imagined us to be. The shining city on the hill, the example for the world of what freedom and liberty looked like, of what the rule of law looks like, of what a battle, a struggle, an engagement of ideas looked like. And Ronald Reagan was dramatically flawed, but at least he had a positive vision of America, a positive view of where we were headed. And what's happened over the last 20 years, as Ayn Rand predicted that it would happen, is that our mixed economy, the fact that the right abandoned ideas or the ideas that they had are so bankrupt, the left has abandoned ideas a long time ago, have led us to Obama and ultimately led us to Trump and have ultimately led us to no shining city on a hill, that hill so broken windows, that hill so mobs, Rampaging through it, that hill showed no respect for rule of law, liberty, freedom, capitalism, any of that. Yeah, it is the authoritarians all over the world chuckling and enjoying this moment. The descent of America into banana republic-like. At least that's its fringes. Now, I know, some of you are going to say, oh... But what about, what about what Antifa did? And what about the, well, yes, they're terrible. They're terrible. I spent the whole summer railing about Antifa and about BLM and about riots and demonstrations and the fact that nobody would do anything about it, including Trump, by the way. But where does that leave us today? At a state where both left and right have abandoned America, both left and right, have abandoned the principles on which this country was founded. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe this is a wake-up call. Maybe those Americans who don't agree with BLM and Antifa and those Americans who don't like Trump, same group. Those Americans who intersect them, not liking BLM and not liking Trump, which I think is still the majority of this country, maybe they wake up. Maybe they wake up and decide that the Republican Party 
needs to be replaced. It's time to kill this party. It's time to end it. Give it to Trump. Let him have the Republican Party. It's time for a new political party, for a new political movement. Yeah, it's not going to be objectivist. It's not going to be free market like I would like to see it. But just a political party of sanity. A political party neither captured by the woke, nutty, critical race theory, defund the police left, or by Trump, conservative, nationalist, narcissistic worshippers. A political party divorced from the authoritarians of the left and the authoritarians of the right. And then maybe we can have a real debate in this country, a real debate about the role of government, the debate we should be having about the future of this country, about the role of government, about how do we get out of the mess we are clearly in. And the only way to get out of this mess, the only way to get out of this mess is to channel the founding fathers of this country. It's to resurrect and improve on those ideas. The only way out of this mess, the only way out of tribalism is to get rid of this mixed economy of everything where the government is involved in every aspect of our lives throughout our economy, throughout our livelihood, everything everywhere we need a return to a true limited government and it's not going to happen in one day but we need to have that debate that debate's not happening with a president who wants two thousand dollar checks not six hundred dollar checks he wants more redistribution of wealth he wants a bigger government he wants more infrastructure spending the government's not spending enough we need more debt we need more constraints on people. We need more controls on the world. That's what the Republican Party stands for. Well, we don't need a Republican Party. The Democrats have stood for that all along. Trump should just join the Democrats. He's just joined the left where he belongs. And there needs to be a political party that actually stands for limited government. Not as limited as I would want it. Not as limited as you would want it. But at least move us in that direction. At least pose as an opposition to the nuttiness that is going on on Capitol Hill. You know, there's a part of me, I have to admit, there's a part of me that was like, these congressmen deserve it. They deserve to hide under their desks. But they don't deserve it for this reason. They don't deserve it because they're upholding the Constitution right now and upholding the certification of the states. If you want to demonstrate against Congress, you should have done it last week when they passed another stimulus bill, when they redistributed more wealth, when they regulated all of our lives. That's when you should have stood up. If you want to stand up for America, then you want to demonstrate against the government intervening in our lives, not against the, ele- the results of an election. That's what they do in banana republics. You demonstrate, you riot, because you don't like the results of an election. So I sympathize with the hatred of Congress, with the hatred of the senators unto this country over the last hundred years slow erosion, systematic erosion of our liberties, of our freedoms. I sympathize with the hatred of the left, particularly the far left, the AOCs of the world, and their commitment to socialism and economics and much worse in our social lives. But I also sympathize with the hatred of the right. Who wants to control our economy? Who wants to control our bodies? Who wants to control our lives? I don't see a right that is pro-freedom, pro-liberty, pro-individual rights. I don't see a right that knows what individual rights are. 
And if there are a few members of Congress here and there who are better, then they need to declare themselves as different. They need to declare themselves as independent. They need to leave. They need to start their own political party. It really is time for something new. And you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it from the Democrats, I don't think. Maybe I'll be surprised. And it looks like now you're not going to get it from the Republicans. But if you elect, you know, I'll, I'll say I told you so again, but if you elect a narcissist who stands for nothing, a narcissist who believes in nothing, a narcissist who is concerned only with how other people view him, which is what narcissists are, but who believes or understands nothing about America and American greatness, then the world in which we live right now is the world that you will get. The only person to blame for the fact today the Democrats control the White House, the Senate, and Congress is Donald Trump. It's not where the country is. It's Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the cause, the reason why the Democrats control everything and why you can expect policies coming out of Congress that are disastrous for America and for our way of life. He has brought us to this. The sooner you recognize that, the sooner the Republicans recognize it, the sooner his supporters recognize it, the sooner we can get things fixed. I don't know if that's possible. I, you know, I, I just don't know. Because collectivism and tribalism are so ingrained in our political system that I don't know what it's going to take to wake people up. Maybe, maybe, again, today we'll wake people up. Maybe seeing those pictures. And again, it's not like a lot of people died. It's not like the place was burned down. It's, you know, it's, but the idea that the Capitol was stormed as Congress was doing its legal obligation to certify a president, or to not even certify, to, to approve of the certification of the states, the idea that that would happen, hopefully that'll wake Americans up, get people who are not a part of the far left and not a part of this wacky right to think about wh where politically this country can head, think about a, a, a better, more productive direction that this country can take, to think about some options political options that do not involve Trumpism and do not involve socialism, do not involve authoritarianism. Maybe, maybe there'll be some rethinking of the Founding Fathers or re-examination of the Founding Fathers or studying the Founding Fathers or reading the Founding Fathers that really needs to happen. Maybe, maybe people start reading Atlas Shrugged. Maybe this is a good time for you guys all to recommend that they read Atlas Shrugged because hell, Atlas is shrugging. It's shrugging out there. It's nuts out there. And it's only going to get worse if something dramatic doesn't happen to change the course that we are heading towards. <sighs> All right. Um, let me just see um it's gonna be i mean it's gonna be i was going to talk a lot about georgia and about the election and about stuff but uh, you know i think i think that will play out we'll have plenty of time to talk about that how congress how the senate is structured now um mansion the senator from west virginia is now going to be the key uh to the future it's going to be interesting tonight to see if the republicans keep objecting to the certification or not or whether they learn from this and they take another path. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where the, uh, the Trump loyalists remain Trump loyalists, where they continue to kiss his feet. And it'll be interesting to see, I mean, based on the comments, uh, Trump loyalists are still out there and still ready for a fight. It's gonna be interesting to see how Congress governs moving forward, um, uh, you know, given what is happening in this country. 
I remind you, Portland is still burning and there's still people out in the streets of Washington, D.C. Um, violence is now the new tool from every direction. Hi. All right. Um, you know, we are now, we're now living in the world. Uh, I, unfortunately, Ayn Rand uh, predicted a world of tribalism, a world of collectivism, a world of, you know, a mixed economy moving towards greater and greater authoritarianism, greater and greater controls less and less liberty. Thank you, Fom. Thank you, Gian. Thank you for all of you who are supporting me on the Super Chat. I really appreciate that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's re reassuring to see that there are people out there who are supportive of uh, my message and are not buying into some people's uh, interpretation of, uh, of events. Uh, Okay, let's see. We've got a bunch of, uh, of Super Chat questions. Let's see. Um, I, I want to look at the ones that are related to what we're talking about. How can the left get culturally more powerful and politically less powerful? Does not politics flow from culture? And where can we purchase tickets to your John Mackey debate? Uh, so uh, the left is, uh, has to get more politically powerful. And you can see that not so much in the Democratic Party getting more politically powerful. It hasn't. You can see it in the fact that the Republican Party has become like Democrats. Again, you saw it today. You can see it in the fact that the Republican Party has shifted way to the left. You can see it in the fact that Trump was indeed, in terms of economic policy, a leftist candidate. In terms of trade policy, a leftist candidate. I would even argue that in terms of immigration policy, he was much more consistent with the Democrats of old than with Republicans of old, or Ronald Reagan kind of Republicans. So... The, the, the manifestation of the left dominance on the culture is that the entire culture, including the entire political spectrum, drifts in their direction. And that happens on the things that are less controversial. Like nobody, with a few exceptions like me and a few of you, nobody is passionate about capitalism and freedom. People, though, are very passionate about cultural issues. They're very passionate about abortion. They're very passionate about... Uh, uh, about race. They're very passionate about what they consider their way of life. They're very passionate about gay marriage. Right? And as the left starts dominating those issues because they've dominated the culture, the people who start opposing the left are not opposing them on grounds of liberty and freedom and capitalism. They start opposing them on the cultural issues. And the more racist the left becomes, cr critical race theory, BLM, identity politics. The more racist the right becomes, the more violent the left becomes, the more violent the right becomes. And because the left dominates the intellectual world, because the, the left dominates the media, because the left dominates the debate, and it does, the right is left as just responsive. All the right does is respond to the left. It's just, it's, it, it, there's, no, there's no intellectual meat on the right to fight the left. So they just react, count at the left. You know, uh, my friend uh, Bradley Thompson is engaged in this massive um, intellectual battle right now with um, BAP, Bronze Age Pervert. There's, a, there's a, a man, I assume he's a man, who calls himself Bronze Age Pervert. Now, remember what the Bronze Age is. The Bronze Age, the Bronze Age is an age of muscle. It's an age of force. It's an age of brutality. It's an anti-intellectual age. It's an anti-ideas age. And Bronze Age Probert is gaining ground. Gaining ground among uh, intellectuals, among uh, uh, right-wing kind of political scientists and right-wing young people. What the alt-right used to be has morphed, or at least a portion of it has morphed into adoration of this Bronze Age pervert. And he is a pervert. And he obviously embraces that. And he's Bronze Age because he believes in muscle, not mind. He rejects the mind. He rejects all of the advancements, the achievements of the last 250 years. He rejects the Enlightenment. He rejects capitalism. He rejects liberty and freedom. 
He wants force, power, muscle. He'll deny much of what I said, but that's the bottom line of what he stands for. Anyway, Brad Thompson has taken him on and has written a number of essays, and you can find him on Twitter, and you can find uh, Brad, Bradley C. Thompson from Clemson University. You can find, he's got a stack, he's, got a, and he's, he's published these articles, they're, you know, they're excellent attacks on BAP. But what's stunning is the amount of support BAP gets. This primitive, barbaric, materialistic mentality the amount of support it gets on the right. And indeed, last night, one of the things that the BAP crowd was celebrating was that Republicans lost in Georgia. What BAP wants is chaos. What many on the right want, on the far right, want is an opportunity for revolution, an opportunity for their muscle, for their force, for the ultimate embracing of, of some form or another fascism. They want every opportunity for that. They want the chaos. And they love Trump, not because necessarily they agreed with anything Trump said, but because he was an agent of chaos. And that is, that is where we're heading. We're heading towards people who want chaos on the left, the BLM and Tifa crowd, to people who want chaos on the right, the alt-right, the Make America Great Again, uh, Fuentes crowd, Nick Fuentes, you can look him up, the racists, and the BAP crowd, the white supremacists of various degrees and means and, and applications. They want chaos. They want anarchy. They want. Revolution. Now, I don't think they have the balls. I don't think they have the courage. They might work out in the gym a lot, but big muscles don't translate into the ability to use them. I don't think they have the balls, the courage to actually engage in revolution. I think they're the, they're the ultimate cowards. But that's what they want. They want brawls in the street. They want to see things burn because they're nihilists. You've got nihilists of the left and nihilists of the right. And what Donald Trump's presidents have done is brought all the nihilists to the forefront, all the nihilists to the front of what is going on. I can't remember what the question was. So yeah, the left has dominated the culture. And what you're seeing is the left dominating culture and influencing politics of left and right and impacting the far left and impacting the far right as a counter movement to the far left. Where can you get tickets to the John Mackey debate, I will let you know as soon as I know. We still don't have the proposition down. I'm, I'm expecting John to call me or to email me any day now so that we can uh, nail down the proposition. But debate will be, unless something happens, February 18th in the villages in Florida, and there will be tickets. Uh, and I'll let you know on this show and on my uh, social media pages where you can get those tickets. Okay, I've never liked Trump, but his calm down and go home message was especially horrific. Yes, it was. Can't believe anyone can believe this guy. I've been saying that for five years. I can't believe anybody likes this guy, but they do. People do. People I respect do. But uh, yes, I thought his message was particularly horrific. Uh, you know, uh, he said, I, I understand you people. Uh, your, your claims are absolutely right. This election was stolen from me. Well, if it was stolen, if, if stolen means force was used against you, well, the only way to, to redress force is with force, right? So he's basically egging them on, encouraging them on. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you, Veni Vidi Vitici. Something like that. <laughs> uh, was Hitler's election legitimate? Yes. I mean, Hitler didn't win a majority in that election, but he certainly won votes. Uh, I think they were legitimate. And he was asked to form a coalition government, which he later took over. But, but even there, you know, part of him declaring a dictatorship and part of him taking over was the burning of the Reichstag, the, the basically capital, the capital, the burning of the Reichstag and, and uh, him using that as a reason to declare in a state of emergency and become a, a, a basically a dictator, you know, if in, in the right circumstances, I don't think America's quite there yet, 
you could imagine that happening in America. Um, uh, let's see. If Democrats destroy the private economy, pack the courts, ramp up censorship, add new states to prevent future Republican dissent, at what point civil disobedience becomes justifiable and in what form should it take? I mean, you could argue civil disobedience is justified today if it's for a proper cause, if it's for liberty and freedom. But civil disobedience for Trump is not a proper cause. I'm all for I'm even for willing to consider, willing to engage. If somebody says it's time for a revolution, let's go. Now, I think it's, a, it's, it's the wrong time. I don't think it's good because we lose. But revolution for what? A revolution is only justified if the end result gives you more liberty and more freedom. Civil disobedience is justified only if you're fighting for a positive cause that will result in more liberty and more freedom. So if there's a movement out there, let me know if there's a movement out there that actually believes in freedom and liberty, that actually wants to preserve the American Constitution, that actually wants to improve on the American Constitution, maybe even, and it wants to preserve capitalism. And it can be called the Republican Party because clearly the Republican Party is none of that. Then, then we can talk about civil disobedience, but not this. This isn't a movement to preserve the American way. This isn't a movement to preserve private property. Trump has no respect for private property. Ask all those CEOs who got phone calls from him telling them how they needed to behave with their own property. Ask Americans who had to pay higher prices for imported goods that they wanted because of his tariffs. And you could go on and on and on in the ways Trump violated the principle of private property. If you're going to oppose the left, you have to oppose it in the name of something. Democrats are not going to, I make a prediction. Democrats are not going to destroy private property, the private economy in the United States. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have a lousy economy, but we would have had that with Trump anyway, because all the spending has to be paid for somehow. I don't think Democrats are going to pack the courts not with a 50-50, not with a 50-50 uh, Senate. They're not going to pack the courts. I, I was dubious about whether they would pack the courts anyway. Even if they'd won more seats in the Senate with 50-50, it's not happening. And with the fact that they lost seats in the House, they don't have, they don't have it. Plus, so they're not packing the courts. Again, my predictions, you can call me on it if I'm wrong. Ramp up censorship. They're not going to. They can't. We have a First Amendment in this country. The U.S. courts are not going to allow ramping up of censorship. You're not going to see massive violation of First Amendment. Are they going to chip away at it? Yes. First Amendment has been being chipped away at for decades now by, by, the, by, by administrations on both sides. And, of course, Trump himself is no fan of the First Amendment. I mean, his rhetoric has done more harm to the First Amendment than probably anything the left has done. And then they're going to add new states. Again, they're not going to do add new states. Again, here's a prediction. No new states will be added. Uh, certainly not Puerto Rico. I mean, what Democrats discovered about Puerto Rico is because the, the, the governor of Puerto Rico endorsed Donald Trump for president and that the Puerto Rican elite, the political elite in Puerto Rico are Republicans, registered Republicans. They're not going to add a new state. But if those things happen, and if you believe in liberty and freedom, and you can be willing to fight for those, then yeah, there's a point in which civil disobedience makes sense, certainly. And it's not about Republicans. I don't give a damn about Republicans. It's about freedom. It's about liberty. Okay, let's... Um... I'm rereading Ankar's One Small Step for Dictatorship, the significance of Donald Trump's election tonight with a whiskey. Yep, you all should. It was an excellent essay. And I think right on. Um, hey, you, 
this is about keeping you and your buddy Klaus Schwab from a great reset. You will own nothing and you will be happy. I, I don't know. I mean, there's this whole idea that I am a socialist. That's interesting. If any, I just did four shows on Schwab and the Great Reset, attacking it. But yeah, here we are. Here are your shekels, Kike. I mean, these people put money to, to do these super chats. The proof is that the ballots were sent unsolicited. I got one I never asked for. So that's fraud? Some states, that was completely legal. That's what the states decided. We're a federation. Federalism, something like that. Anyway, um, you're frigging you know, anti-Semitic. Uh, it's people like you who are killing this country. Literally, people like you are destroying this country. Uh, today was a national embarrassment. Trump certainly deserves a great deal of blame. But what about the media? Half the country feels disenfranchised with no representation and the seeds were sown long ago. I agree. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 think, I think that the media, to, to a large extent, to blame. But ultimately, the people to blame are the people that Ayn Rand identified, that I've identified over and over again. I don't primarily blame the common people who feel disenfranchised. I blame the intellectuals. This is an intellectual battle. And the intellectuals have been feeding the American people garbage for a hundred years that's gotten worse and worse and worse every decade. And yes, it's absolutely their fault that we're in a situation which, where people don't recognize this country. But the solution to that is not to abolish the country, which is what they were trying to do today. It's not to abolish the principles on, this, on which this country is founded, which is what Trump is constantly trying to do. And which the far left would like to do. It's not to play into their hands. It's to mount an intellectual challenge to their ideas. And if you think, if you think that's hopeless, then it's hopeless. Then it's hopeless. <laughs> If we're not going to win it on intellectual grounds, we're not going to win, period. Because even if we, our tribe, our team, our side kind of wins, we still lose. Because authoritarianism of the right and authoritarianism of the left, I'm still a loser. You're still a loser. Americans are still losers. All those disenfranchised Americans are still losers. So if you care about disenfranchised Americans, and I do, I don't blame them. I, I mean... Never blame the common man because she understood that they're out there struggling day in, day out to make a living. And they rely on the intellectuals to, large, to some extent through the media and through the schools and through the universities and through the internet now to communicate ideas, to, to tell them what's going on in the world. I mean, average people don't understand economics and economics is not a an obvious science, for example. So, you know, I don't blame average Joe for not understanding why tariffs are bad. It, it's a difficult concept. It seems intuitive that tariffs are good. But when nobody on the right stands up against tariffs, when none of the economists who claim to be free market economists stand up against tariffs, I shouldn't say none, but very few of them, when the Wall Street Journal doesn't stand up and shout from the mountaintop against tariffs, then I can't blame the common man for not knowing that they're bad because the intellectuals have abandoned the common man. The intellectuals have betrayed the common man. The treason here is the treason of the intellectuals. And the ultimate treason with the Trump administration is are the intellectuals of the right, are the conservatives who have sold their soul to Donald Trump, who have justified everything he's done, who, if any one of his actions had been done by a Democrat, they would have said it was the end of the world. But because it's Donald Trump, they justified it. They explained it away. They, they, they licked his boots. So many of them, all those brave talk radio, right-wing talk radio guys, who stand supposedly for liberty and freedom. But when Donald Trump violated liberty and freedom, oh, it was okay because it was for a good cause. That's who's to blame. But the media on all sides, whether it was Fox, Fox has become better, surprisingly, but whether it was Fox or whether it was CNN, whether it was everybody in between and everybody at the extremes, at the, at the 
extremes of those or the outside of those. Yes, they've all betrayed the American people. And the solution to that betrayal is to look for objective sources of, sources of information to highlight those people who produce ideas to counter the ideas of left and right today. You want to fight this battle, then get your copy of Alice Shrugged out and go and try to get people to read it. I mean, in a nice way. Don't be, don't be obnoxious about it. If you want to combat what's going on right now, don't join a tribe. Think for yourself. Advocate for your ideas. Go out there and speak, speak, speak. Write, write, write. Engage with the issues of the day. Not as a member of a tribe. Not as a follower. Not as a worshiper of a personality. But as somebody who stands for ideas that stand apart and are opposed to the ideas of the culture as it stands right now. You want to win, then fight in the only battlefield that matters long term. And that is the battlefield of ideas, not the street, not the tribe, not really politics. We've lost politics. Politics is gone. Forget politics. Politics is downstream from culture. And culture, culture is downstream from philosophy. Culture is downstream from ideas. Culture is downstream from the intellectuals. You want to change the world? Change the intellectuals. And if you can't change the intellectual, if you're not going to become an intellectual, then support the good intellectuals. Share the good material. If you care about your life, it's time you stood up. It's time you took a stand. And if you're not going to write the articles, then find good articles and share them. If you're not going to do a podcast, Find the good podcasts and share them and support them. Stop standing on the sidelines. Take a stand. And if you stand for freedom, if you stand for liberty, if you stand with Ayn Rand, then support those of us fighting for her ideas, which means fighting intellectually for her ideas. And if you're not supporting those ideas, then don't complain when the world goes to hell. Because the world will go to hell if good people like you don't stand up and fight. Don't make your voice heard. Don't make your dollars mean something. And I'm not, this, this is a fundraising pitch, but that's, it's broader than that. It's the idea that the good has to stand up and fight. You remember yesterday, I talked on my show about the exodus from San Francisco and the lesson learned. The lesson learned is that the good needs to fight. That if the good doesn't get involved, if the good doesn't get engaged with the battle of ideas, then the bad, the evil will trump all over us. All over us. And that's what happened in San Francisco to Silicon Valley, to the better people in Silicon Valley. They got trumped. They got stomped on by San Francisco leftists, not from the tech community, but the anti-tech leftists, the 60s leftists. And they didn't get involved. And they didn't defend themselves. You want to defend themselves? Hire intellectuals to defend you. And defend yourself using intellectual means. If people are going to advocate violence in the chat, at least make them pay to have you acknowledge them. Yeah, you're right. Well, some of them did pay. Um, you know, the anti-Semites paid. Millions once fled west to the land of the free, where men were free, their opportunities unlimited, and their spirits lit with the vision of great of the great of greatness. Beautifully, nicely written. Centuries later, the ideas which they once fled have returned to predominate. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That American spirit, that spirit, and let's let's be clear what that spirit is. That spirit is a spirit of individualism. That spirit is a spirit of I can do it. I can do it. That spirit is the spirit of liberty, of freedom. Of leave me alone. It's not a spirit of collectivism, of tribalism, of looking for government, for, 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 for help and everything. It's a spirit of independence, not tribalism. It's the anti-Trump spirit and the anti-Biden spirit. 
But it's the anti-Trump spirit. And I say anti-Trump because the people behind Trump are the people who claim to be Americans with a capital A. And yet they're the ones stabbing America in the back right now. Is Latin America a good breeding ground for political freedom? Or where else do you think could be the next home for American ideas? I don't know. I mean, it might be Latin America partially because they've experienced all of this. They know firsthand what it looks like. They've lived through it. They've seen it. But, you know, you look around Latin America and there's nothing positive really going on. I mean, uh, Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil is, is a disaster, uh, I think. From everything I can read, corruption is, I mean, he was supposed to be the anti-corruption. He is the corruption. Um, they, they were supposed to free up and liberate the economy. They've done a few things, but, but nothing dramatic. All my optimism about, uh, you know, the people Bolsonaro uh, uh, appointed uh, in his cabinet, all that optimism, most of that optimism is gone. Look at Argentina that elected somebody who was a huge fan of the fountainhead and turned into a complete statist, Nincompoop, who couldn't do anything. So uh, I don't see it in, in Latin America. Colombia, maybe? I, I don't know. I mean, Mexico's going down a, a socialist rabbit hole. Maybe Colombia, but, uh, you know, it, it just there's no reason to see it. it again, it's, it's an intellectual battle, and the ideas of not, not enough of these ideas have caught on. And libertarians think it's just economics and politics, and they miss the boat. This is about ethics. This is about philosophy. And until the philosophical ideas, and until the ideas of Ayn Rand become prevalent, dominant, I don't see how this can catch on. I mean, we will see. Who knows where it'll catch on first. But I was, I've been hopeful about Latin America. I've been hopeful about Eastern Europe. I was even hopeful about China. That turned out really bad, right? Uh, China went exact opposite direction. Uh, thanks for saying all this and the great analysis you've been putting out over the last year. Appreciate it. Uh, as a former resident of the Dominican Republic, I appreciate your Puerto Rico traffic joke from the ESFL France lecture. I can't, I can't remember what that joke was. But anyway, um, the only thing we had going for us was that Trump is a moron and was not competent enough to be the American Julius Caesar. True. Looks like the pieces were there, but he luckily couldn't draw them together. I agree with that. I, you know, again, you think about the burning of the Reichstag. Hitler was, was far more dominant, far more charismatic, far more... Uh, confident and 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 had the support of the military and 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 had laid the foundation and was ready to pounce because he was far smarter. Um, the inclination, the inclination for authoritarianism is definitely there. All right, uh, that's what why we saw about debate today's debacle. They thought they were standing up to tyranny without realizing they were defending it. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. They 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 think. They have no concept of what freedom and liberty really stand for. They have no concept of what they mean. And now they associate it with a man who is 100% a pragmatist, who stands for no principle, who admires authoritarians in other countries, who has not stood up for America anywhere in the world. And, you know, is just as much of a statist as anybody on the left think they are standing up for America. They have so little conception of what America stands for. They wave the American flags, but they don't know what America is. It's like what I've argued all along with them, make America great again. You have to know what America is to make it great. You have to know what it was to make it great. You have to know what it stands for. America is an idea. It's not, as Tucker Carlson claimed, I did a show on this, the beautiful scenery and the religion of its people. That's not what America is. America is the ideas on which it was founded. America is the Declaration of Independence. That's what America is. But they ask it at any level, really at any level. Collectivism is a disease. People need to stop voting along political party lines. Yes, they need to start voting for ideas, for better people versus worse people. Is the silver lining that this can be a wake-up call for Republicans that wouldn't have happened if Trump had been re-elected? Trying to weigh 
that versus damage done by Democrats in the meantime, at least two years. I mean, I was hoping that that would be the case. I was hoping that Republicans would stand up for Trump after he lost. I was hoping that they would win at least one seat in Georgia. And I think they would have if they would have stood up for, to Trump. I think they would have captured maybe they would have lost some of the rabid Trump supporters where they would they would have captured, I think, the the independent vote, which they lost in the Georgia uh, elections in a big time. People who don't want more government, don't want more government intervention, but can't stand Donald Trump and what he represents. Those are the people they should have gone after, but they didn't. Instead, they played to Trump's base and they lost. Um, the silver lining is that maybe the Republican Party will wake up. I really have my doubts. We will see how it plays out tonight even. Tonight even. We will see how many of these Republicans come out and stand up for the rule of law. That'll be the standard. Yuan, you've been correct about Trump all along. Thank you. Well, thank you for recognizing that. Thank you for your massively important work you're on, and thank you for calling out the cowards, no matter which side of the aisle they're on. Thank you. Thank you again for recognizing that. Is there a connection between anarchism and authoritarianism? Yes. I mean, I, I think there is. I think the connection is that... What happened there? Am I still on YouTube? Whoops. Am I on anything, any platform? <laughs> what happened? Uh, it says here I'm still online. That looks like it's still streaming. Ay. I think you have to reload. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, so can you guys see me? Can, say, can you guys on the chat tell me if you just said this? Um, uh, where did he go? Hi, Yvonne. Am I there? Uh, do, you, do you see me? Uh, how about on Facebook? I'm not sure how you would let me know. Maybe somebody can, uh, can text me. Um, anybody uh, on... Uh, Okay, it's still live. Just reload, guys. It's uh, I'm still live. I'm not sure what threw me out there. All right, I'm still going through uh, the super chat questions. Let's uh, let's see what those are. All right, is the connection between anarchism and authoritarianism? Yes, the the connection is that anarchism inevitably must lead to authoritarianism. Now, um, I will I will do I will do I will comment on this further. Um, in um, one of our future shows. I know Michael Malice just did a show on Lex, with Lex Friedman, and in that show he commented on my comments about anarchy, um, and, and he made some uh, counter-arguments to my comments about anarchy. I am going to uh, counter his arguments, at least uh, you know online, um, on, on video. Um, so I will be talking more about anarchy. But anarchy uh, is the elevation of violence it is, it is the recognition that violence is a way and is a legitimate way in which to arbitrate disputes. And it, it inevitably leads to the guy with the biggest gun taking control of everybody else. It inevitably leads to authoritarianism. Um, it, it, so that's the relationship between anarchy and authoritarianism. I, uh, I sent an email you never responded to. It asked if you would consider posting clips on a separate channel. It would clutter the channel and would increase your average interaction. In YouTube, I mean, there's a there are um, various schools of thought about whether you should create a separate channel for clips or whether you should do your clips on your main channel. Um, and 
I don't really have a strong opinion about that. Uh, I see people on a different channel. So I, it looks like it started on a different channel on YouTube. I'll try to, I'll try to pick up the chat. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. That's a, it's a marketing decision that my marketing people have so far advised me, uh, in a sense on, uh, not, let me just see what is going on. All right. This is live. It says this is live. Is there a chat here? Um, yeah, it's 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 managing a whole nother channel. Right now, I don't have the staff and I don't have the means to do it. Maybe one day we'll get to that point and we'll do it. it you know, if my marketing people convince me that that is the right way to go and we have the resources to do it, we will do it. But so far, uh, so far, no, uh, I have not. I see there's a bunch of super chat on this. Mark asks, thanks, Yaron, for being such a principled, rational voice against Trumpism and, indi and for individual rights. On a day like today, it's especially appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I appreciate the support. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, geez. Everything's going kind of haywire on me right now. I apologize, but we will get, I guess... I don't know why YouTube ended one stream and started another. I have no idea. Uh, my uh, Maybe it's my uh, setup here. Kind of... Uh, all right. All right, we're back to Super Chat. All right, let's see. Um, I think you're overplaying the narrative of Bronze Age as much as BAP. It was the age where writing was proliferated Site, uh, cities formed and grew, tool making and farm were revolutionized and advances in math were made. I mean, all that might be true, but that's not what BAP means by Bronze Age, right? Uh, so I'm just, I'm just interpreting him. I'm not interpreting what really happened in the Bronze Age. I'm not an historian, I'm not an expert in that. I'm saying, why is Bronze Age pervert using the Bronze Age? He's not using the Bronze Age because he wants to. See, he is a, a supporter of writing and proliferation of cities and civilization. It's the exact opposite. It's because he is a supporter of what maybe I falsely think the Bronze Age represents. But that's what it means. That's what BAP means by it. Okay. Happy New Year, Ron. What are the realistic similarities and differences between Hitler and Trump, in your opinion? Well, I I, I think the biggest difference between them. I mean, there, there are a lot of differences, but, but one difference is that Germany was ready for authoritarianism um, and ready to submit uh, when Hitler rose to power, that it was far more uh, infected with uh, duty philosophy, with a, with a duty mentality, with an authoritarian view of the world with a sense of life that was ready to just take orders than America. So the biggest difference between them is the circumstances under which they came uh, to power. Uh, I think Hitler was smarter, more charismatic, more devious, more cunning, more scheming, more uh, able to organize and build a movement, um, uh, but also obviously more evil and, and more despicable and more hated. And, you know, I don't, I don't think... Hitler, and, and I don't think there's really any similarities. I don't think Donald Trump set out to be a dictator. I think Hitler did. I don't think Donald Trump has an ideology. Hitler did. I don't think, and this is why, partially why Donald Trump cannot be successful as an authoritarian, is he doesn't stand for anything. He's not for anything. He doesn't, he's not an advocate for something. Right? So, uh, you know, Trump is just a, uh, you know, as a pragmatist who stands for nothing, whereas Hitler stood for something evil. So I don't put them on the same scale. I, I, I don't like the comparisons of Trump to Hitler. I don't think it's useful and, and I don't think it's helpful for anything. I don't think it, it, it aids our understanding of either Trump or Hitler. Trump is an authoritarian of a completely different kind. And, and uh, he, he is incompetent because he doesn't stand for anything, because he has no ideas, because he has no integrating principle on which to channel his energy. He is an agent of chaos more than anything else. He's not an agent of unity, which would be authoritarianism, right? 
he is a uh, you know he is a agent of chaos and and and, and that does not that it that, that will not result directly in him being a authoritarian. It will ultimately, to the extent that he's successful in being about chaos, result in somebody else becoming an authoritarian, whether again or left or right, they will become an authoritarian partially because of the way in which the, the, the world has, uh, has, the world in which Trump is leaving us with. Um, okay. Um, trying to catch up with all the super chats here. All right, let's see. What, do you, uh, what are the chances the Republican Party will now demand Trump resign? I think zero. Zero. Because they're completely in his spellbound by his, they're completely scared of his supporters, of the people who, 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 who uh, you know, attack the uh, Capitol. The, the Capitol, they're the people who they want their votes, and they're afraid of them. They're afraid of them in their district. They're afraid they won't be... In a, they won't be elected. They're afraid they'll be primaried. They're afraid they won't get the nomination for president. They want Trump's endorsement. They No, I don't see the Republican Party standing up to Trump. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I just don't see it. What are your thoughts? Uh, no, uh, I'll get to that. A man's ego is, is the fountainhead of human progress. Ayn Rand, Your Honor, I will never subscribe to your tribe. You don't have to. I'm not asking you to. No podcast needed. Do your life by Right. And why were you here? Why did you make the comment? I, I never understand these people who say you're useless. I don't want you. But here I am listening to every word you say. Bizarre. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Farouk says the left BLM Antifa normalized the violence. I, I, I don't I doubt they normalized the violence. These are the people. These are the people who are attacking the violence of the left and you know so now it's okay for them to be violent I, I don't know what normalizing the violence means um you, you know suddenly the media was tolerant of violence when it was in a for a cause that they believed in and uh, that has upset people on the right and justifiably upset them but the solution to that is not to engage in your own violence that that is not going to lead to liberty and freedom the amount of double thinking from a self-proclaimed objectivist, it's quite an achievement. It will be, it will for sure monetize. Don't know what you're talking about, but I assume you're trying to insult me. I don't know what the double thinking is. I, I mean, this is like the claims of fraud. No evidence is provided. No actually concrete. Where was my double speak? Where did I say something that contradicted itself? I'm happy to learn from you, but you have to actually give me an example. But no, I mean, facts, evidence, proof that is outside the realm of what one can expect from people these days. Does there remain any chance of repeat, repealing, appealing to Trump supporters using their legitimate values such as they are, or are they totally beyond the pale? Well, it depends what you mean by Trump supporters. I've, I've tried to differentiate between, I think there are a lot of people, and I think you saw this in Georgia, a lot of people uh, who, who might have voted for Trump, but then were disgusted by what Trump has done over the last six weeks or whatever. Um, I think they've been. Uh, I, I think that people who who voted for Trump, but suddenly have positive values that can be appealed to, but there are people out there who are mindless followers of Trump, who think that Trump walks on water, that everything he does, that wrap themselves in the Trump flag. I don't think those people have legitimate values. They have legitimate grievances, maybe but they have no legitimate values. They have no legitimate positive things. Uh, and I don't think they can appeal to. I think the challenge is, how do we find, how do we appeal, how, how does somebody, not because I don't think it's going to be me, how does somebody appeal to the people who voted for Trump because they despise the left and despise Trump. They didn't like Trump. They didn't like what Trump was doing. But they voted for Trump as the less of two evils. They voted for Trump because they thought the left was so bad that, how do how do how do we get those people to recognize what you know how do we provide an alternative to those people how does a political party a political party because i'm not sure it could be the republicans but a, how does a political party how does a political party provide an alternative a valid proper alternative to the left that's the question 
and then they will appeal to the better people who voted for Trump. But first, there has to be a legit political party who, who is anti-left and pro-America, but pro a proper conception, at least a semi-proper conception of what America is. And that is how you appeal to the better people within the Trump supporters. SpaceX said Mars will be a self uh, will be run on self governing principles. If their plan works, will future objectives be Martians? Maybe, but why would you think any government would let their plan work? I mean, it could be that they can get there without the permission of government and then establish a self governing entity there. But I, you know, the governments have the weapons. It's not going to be easy to start a free society in Mars that is free of intervention from the U.S. government. I hope it's possible. And I would, uh, you know, and if I were young, I would, I would uh, get on a spacecraft and, and be happy to go and, and start a new colony on Mars. I think that's exciting and thrilling and, and a, 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 an amazing opportunity. But is all of that realistic? Is it all of that possible? And when will it happen? Did you hear Biden's speech today? Many references to the common good, sanctity of democracy, very Atlas Shrugged, lots of Atlas today. Yeah, I mean, Biden is terrible. Nobody supports Biden. I certainly have never supported Biden in any way, in any respect. But his speech was better than Trump's. And what politician in the last hundred years has not appealed to the common good and the common interest and the sanctity of democracy? Every politician, left and right, I mean, Trump hasn't because he doesn't appeal to anything, really. But, you know, what politician doesn't, in the end, appeal to a cause greater than yourself? And all of them, left and right, Republicans and Democrats. So the idea that Biden is unique because he suddenly talks about the common good. I mean, Ted Cruz talks about the common good. Suddenly Rubio talks about the common good. Hawley, Josh Hawley talks about the common good all the time. He believes in common good conservatism. They all talk about the common good. The common good doesn't differentiate left and right. They're all common good. Oops, what did I delete there? I think I deleted the wrong thing. No, okay, I just had that copy twice. Uh, you're on your trooper doing a show ahead of your personal woes at this time. Personal woes are minor as compared to what's going on right now. Um, question from your 2003 discussion on total war. Is it okay for Vietnam to have used total war against us since we evaded unjustifiably? No. Because Vietnam were the villain. Vietnam were, the, were evil. Vietnam were fighting for slavery, for communism, for authoritarianism. They, they, they have no rights. They have no legitimacy. They have no... It's not okay for them to do anything other than surrender. It's not... And, 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 and Ayn Rand said this very well. Uh, dictatorships don't have... Um, legitimacy. Dictatorships don't have uh, 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 um, sovereignty. So we didn't invade unjustifiably. I mean, the unjustifiable part of it was that it was against American interests. But it wasn't because we violated some uh, sanctity or some um, uh, sovereignty of the Vietnamese. North Vietnam had no sovereignty because it was a dictatorship. I did see you super chat about Wyoming. I will get to it, I promise. It's very soon because we're running. I'm trying to do stuff that's somewhat related. Do you think Trump could have intentionally torpedoed the Republicans after he lost? Could he be just be as spiteful and evil as every other politician? I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I don't think. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he intentionally torpedoed Republicans. He has no loyalty towards Republicans who are not 100% boot licking loyal to him. I mean, you saw that. Uh, what was the name of the of his first justice minister? It, you know, it was a senator from Alabama. And he was the first guy to endorse Trump and he was supported Trump throughout the election. And he was he was became attorney general uh, as a result of that. And then as soon as he did something Trump didn't like appointing a, a, an independent prosecutor. But he didn't do it out of disloyalty because this guy, his whole everything was Trump. As soon as he did that, 
He became enemy number one for Trump and Trump immediately got rid of him. The same happened time after time again to anybody, anybody. Mathis was the greatest general in all of human history when Trump appointed him. Trump's saints said that and all of Trump's supporters said that. This was the greatest secretary of defense ever. But as soon as Mathis disagreed with Trump, he was out and he was deemed to be a horrible person, a horrible general, a horrible human being. By not just by Trump, but all the Trump, Trump supporters. Uh, Bolton, when Bolton was appointed to be his, his, uh, his uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, whatever the title is. Um, he was the greatest. He was so smart. He was so good. And everybody loved Bolton. Everybody was a Bolton supporter. They thought Bolton was amazing. As soon as Bolton turned against Trump or did something that Trump disagreed with, oh my God, he's the worst human being possible. Nothing brings you peace but the triumph of principles. R R Ralph Waldo Emerson said that. That's very good. I think the resilience of the U.S.'s political institutions against Trump's power grab proves that the principles are still alive. I agree with that. I think our so system of government is resilient. I think we will survive all of this. We will survive, but we will be weaker. And we are weaker. And we head into... A, a another a four year term with a Democratic president who's weak with a Senate and House that are influenced heavily by the far left. We head into that with institutions that are clearly being weakened. And every four years they get weaker. At some point, at some point, those institutions will crumble. We're not ready for that yet. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but at some point it will. What are your thoughts on living in Wyoming? I like the weather. Well, that's good. Uh, it appears to be a great state to buy land along with Montana and Idaho. It appears that all three states have a strong sense of freedom. Yeah, I think they do. I, I, I think it's a beautiful place. I know a lot of people who live in Wyoming um, and, and they love it. And uh, uh, low taxes, low regulations, not as low as some other places, but low regulations. And generally still a bit of a, that Western pro-freedom spirit uh, that is America. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think those are states that embrace freedom. It's too bad that they're cold, but they are beautiful. That's the other thing about Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, but particularly Wyoming. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful country. Montana is a beautiful country. Idaho, also a beautiful country, actually. All three. I mean, and, and very livable. Particularly Wyoming and, uh, you know, around, uh, I'm thinking Cheyenne, but I don't like Cheyenne. Cheyenne is ugly. Uh, around uh, Jackson Hole, that part of the world is just gorgeous. Just beautiful. Um, okay, Michael Sandel strikes me as smart, thoughtful, and completely dishonest. Yes, I agree with all that. How does this combination happen? Well, it happens pretty early. It happens with small evasions. It's happened with not wanting to rethink some of your basic premises and then you build on top of those dishonest basic premises you build more and more and more and you become so committed to these ideas that now it's impossible for you to look and challenge and rethink your premises so i think i think that's what happens with people they 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 evade when they're young and then the evasions just build on one another and then you create this whole edifice which is which is basically built on a dishonesty but it's impossible for you to actually see it could you do a video commenting on his ted talk yes i plan to it's tough to to, to, to do a video on a ted talk because they're so long but but i will at least do on a portion of his ted talk um, that's a good idea what got john mackey to agree to debate you i don't know i i haven't talked to mackey and i don't know because in the past he's turned it down so i don't know what got him to it, it gene epstein put this all together uh, so Gene Epstein, um, uh, the guy who debated me on selfishness a, 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 a couple of years ago, I think now, uh, he put this debate together and it's his forum. You mentioned in the past that he, he thought you were as, uh, too small. for. I don't know if it's small fish to debate. I just didn't think he wanted to debate objectivists. I don't know why he's changed his mind, but it seems he has, which is good. Does he bring anything to the table that you consider interesting and you? Yeah. I do. I, I think he is an interesting, and unique guy, partially because he's a successful CEO of a successful company. I think he's thoughtful. I, I, I think he's he's smart. Um, I think he's wrong on a lot of things, but I think he's thoughtful and smart and and, and interesting. And he's 
in in a, in his own way, he's he's pro freedom and pro liberty and pro capitalism. Not not the kind of capitalism I I believe in. Not in real. Cap- but he's he, he's he is an ally. I think an ally that undermines us, <laughs> if that's possible, right? An ally that undermines us because of his own weakness. And but that's why we're debating. Uh, now again, I don't expect to convince him. But we're debating because I think a lot of people are undermined by the same kind of phenomena that he is. And I think it's an interesting topic that, that challenges a lot of people. So I am, uh, I am, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in, in seeing it. Um, all right. The assertion of most politicians of the common good is simply an evasion of admission uh, to the inability to understand the principles the principled specific good. You can do most anything in the name of the common good. Absolutely. Absolutely. But but it's more than an evasion of their inability to understand. They complete in a sense they, they completely understand that it is a means to power. It's a means to to control. You know, the common good is whatever they want it to be. Whatever they can convince people, it should be. It gives them complete flexibility about molding and shaping their agenda, and uh, and it, it it rejects it implicitly rejects individualism and embraces collectivism, and but they understand what kind of lever it has on power and how it can be used to attain power, and that's why they do it. That's why they do it. Also because they don't understand individualist principles. I, I agree with that. All right. Um, I think we'll call it in a night. Thank you all for joining us. I'm sorry we had the technical glitch. We, we unfortunately dropped uh, about 200 people who uh, didn't find the second stream, but uh, I think they got they got the, bit, the beginning of it. Um, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I hope very much that, you know, that lessons will be learned from this. I hope very much that... Um, that this country can turn and uh, can discover it, its true nature, can discover the ideas that make it made it great. Um, I really think it's up to us. It's up to those of us who believe in freedom, believe in liberty, believe in individualism, believe in reason. It's up to us to advocate. It's up to us to, to, to stand on the mountaintop. It's us, for, up to us to create a shining city, a shining something, so that people look up to us. It, this is one of the things, one of the things that upset me about people's, uh, so many people who claim, you know, so many people who are objectivists, who claim to be objectivists, or all, all kinds of people. Uh, blind devotion to Donald Trump in the name of Ayn Rand, again, the blind devotion to Donald Trump in the name of Ayn Rand, is that it undermines the, the, the ability of the, people who, who uh, are true advocates of reason and, and capitalism and individualism to, to fight the battle that needs to be fought to move this country in the right direction. Uh, yep, there are people on the chat who want to make it my fault. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, we need to fight on the basis of proper philosophical foundations, of proper ideological foundations, of proper ideas. Otherwise, we all lose. And if we give up right at the beginning by embracing some form of tribalism and collectivism, then we are all lost. And uh, you know, we've, we've lost the game and we've lost the match and we've lost everything. So, the lesson to be learned from the events of today, the events of the last five years, is recommit yourself to the ideas that made this country a great country. Recommit to the, yourself to the ideas, the ideas that are make your life a great life. Recommit to yourself to the ideas of America. Recommit to yourself to the ideas of reason, individualism, the ideas of Ayn Rand. Go read an Ayn Rand essay tonight. Go read an Ayn Rand essay tonight. Inspire yourself with Ayn Rand's mind, with Ayn Rand's genius. 
because that's what we're going to need. We're going to need Ayn Rand's genius if we're going to turn this country around. And that's what we should be fighting for. That's still what we should be fighting for. Stop the compromising. Stop the selling out. Stick to the principles. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. I'll see you probably Friday, maybe Saturday. We will see. Um, bye, all.